for anyone who doesn't know who I am, my name's Stuart. I'm one of the leaders here, and we're going to be carrying on our series looking at the book of James. Um, the words are going to be on the screen in a minute, um, but if you want a Bible, there's a box of Bibles down there because we're going to be looking at a passage that's probably quite familiar to some of us. It's in chapter 3. It's called The Taming of the Tongue. Uh, you might have heard it uh, spoken about before, um, but it's always good to remind ourselves about some of these passages um, even uh, when we have heard them before, particularly when they're as challenging as this one. So how do we use our words? Are we in control of what we say at all times? Do we use our words to speak life and blessing, or can we be sometimes prone to speaking harshly or deceitfully? Or do we stay silent when we should actually be speaking up? What words do we speak over ourselves as well as the words that we might speak over other people? So let's turn to James chapter 3 and we're going to read from verses 1 to 12. Not many of you should presume to be teachers, my brothers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. We all stumble in many ways. If anyone is never at fault in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to keep his whole body in check. When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole person, sets the whole course of his life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles and creatures of the sea are being tamed and have been tamed by man, but no man can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. That's a cheery passage, isn't it? Um, Before we get into... um, the words in chapter 3, I want to just re-go back to chapter 1 in James and some of what he's already introduced, because this is unpacking some themes that he was already kind of teeing up. That's the same with what we've been looking at the last couple of weeks and what we're going to go on to look at. And it's important to grasp that context. So in verse 18 of chapter 1, he talks about how we're actually born again. We're a new spiritual person. Paul talks about becoming a new creation. And that's really important to get our heads around all of what James is talking about. And Josh last week really unhelpfully unpacked this whole thing because if you read James in isolation, you can think it's all about our works rather than about what Jesus did. But it's not about that. James is really direct about the fact that we need to be a new being and so what we're doing when we when he's talking about how we out show our faith outwardly is not what we're doing in order to gain God's favor but it's because of what God has done for us that the love that he has shown for us the changes that he has made in us that that is going to change how we are on the outside it's not about our striving Then in chapter 1, in verses 26 
and 27, he marks out three areas or three marks that should be the hallmarks of true religion, of having that change within us. It says, if anyone considers himself religious and yet does not keep a tight rein on his tongue, he deceives himself and his religion is worthless. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. So he's talking about how we treat other people, caring ministries, talking about widows and orphans, but as we've been looking at over the whole few weeks, uh, last couple of weeks, it's about favouritism. How do we relate to other people is one of those hallmarks of the change inside us. And he talks about how we use words. And then he talks about keeping ourselves from being polluted by the world, holiness, which we're going to come on to in the next couple of weeks. That verse 26 in particular is relevant to today. If anyone considers himself religious. He's actually a challenge to people who say they are religious, but they haven't actually had that change inside. And he's saying if you don't keep a tight rein on your tongue, you're just deceiving yourself. Your religion is worthless. And we'll come on to that a bit more later. Right at the beginning of this series as well, Joshua talked to us about how we should expect trials. That's part of what comes with um, the territory. But it's actually you, they can be used by God to make us mature. They're a training ground to demonstrate some of that internal change that's gone within us. And if I look at some of the people I know who have been through the most, who have held firm and been refined to the point that they can control their tongue and they continue to care for others and they continue to seek to live a holy life and speak words of life and blessing. And we've got one amongst us today, Dave Grove, who lots of you will know. He's been through all sorts of stuff in his life. Yet when you speak to him, it's the overflow of everything that's within him brings life and blessing and joy and encouragement. He doesn't go around moaning, which he could easily and probably we might think has a right to do. (laughs) I'm sure you do. And in verse 19, it also talks about how we control our tongue. About, uh, and I think it's alluding to when we go through trials, it says we should be slow to anger, quick to listen, slow to speak. That slow to anger really resonates with what we know about the character of God, what we read in the Old Testament about how God is slow to anger. And it reminded me of the, the famous uh, quote, which is... Um, Credited to Epictetus, the Greek philosopher, I don't know if I've said that right, which is we have two ears and one mouth, so we should listen twice as much as we speak. And that's not a bad principle to live by. So in chapter one, we've got this situation where we're born again. We've been changed and transformed on the inside by what Jesus has done. And because of that, we should be marked on the outside by our behaviour. And that is what James is dealing with. One of those marks is how we speak and use our words. And even when we go through trial and difficulty, as we mature, we should be able to speak life and blessing and be in control of our tongue. So that's what he teed up in chapter one. And then we come on to this section in chapter three, when he goes into more detail. And first of all, he talks about the power of words. It's always concerning when you're preparing a preach when the first verse of the passage is how teachers will be judged more harshly. <laughs> but it's relevant here because teaching, whether it's with spoken word or whether it's writing, is a talking profession. It's a word based profession. And just as we've already seen in James that we are not to be only hearers of the word but doers as well. James is cautioning against being speakers and teachers of the word and not doers. We need to align. And because teachers have that responsibility of using words and then influencing others, they will be judged more harshly. So he's also discouraging people from seeking eagerly that role and particularly that role too early. Because we need the foundation in our faith and the understanding 
to be able to teach correctly, and it brings risk, as he's saying. So we should all be ready to give an account of our faith, to share about what Jesus has done in us, but we should be cautious about presuming that we have a teaching role. And the power of words is consistent throughout Scripture. Paul in Romans, when he's talking about how we all sin, we all fall short of what um, God's best is for us, says these words from Psalm 36, their throats are open graves, and he's talking about everyone here, their tongues practice deceit, the poison of vipers is on their lips, their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. He's quite clear that there's real power and problems because of the words we use and the way we speak. Isaiah talked about how he was a man of unclean lips and the need for holiness. Peter says anyone who would love life and seek good days should keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking guile. So it's a it's consistent pattern. It's not just James that talks about this, but this passage really brings it home. The power of our words. And James talks about it like a master key or a master switch that controls everything else we do. Is that how we view the way we use words? as something that controls everything. You might be thinking, really? What about what I do with my body? But the tongue is more than just the words we speak out loud when James is talking here. It's the words in our thoughts. It's the w words are the essence of how we think, how we plan, how we imagine, how we resent, how we feel sorry for ourselves, how we perceive ourselves. And it's not just what we say in our head and out of our mouth, it's what we write. It's what we post on social media. There's so many ways that we use words. And James is saying that actually words are a deed. Like last, in the last few weeks, we've looked at faith and deeds, faith and actions. Words lead to action. And it's so significant. It is the key to holiness. And James gives us two examples, the rudder and the bridle. So we know we all can use our words unwisely and sinfully. We can gossip, gossip, or we might in church call it prayer concerns, but it's the same thing. We can give a harsh word in the heat of the moment. We can have a choice word to the wonderful driver that cuts us up with their fantastic driving ability. We can um, share a coarse or crude joke, or we can speak untruths over ourselves, or we can not speak up for those with no voice. Lying, backbiting, being indiscreet, flattery, pride, speaking too much, being argumentative, swearing. There's so many different ways. But James is not actually, his main point is not actually to say we should be on guard for those and we should try and stop doing them. That might well be a good thing. Self-control is a fruit of the Spirit. We should be self-controlled. But that is not what James is trying to point out here. He's saying it's far more important than just trying to control on the surface. He's saying that actually if we can control that, we can control everything. So we've got these two examples, the brider, the bridle, and the rudder. Two tiny things with the ability to steer and control much larger entities. The first, the bridle, and he mentions a horse, a powerful horse. At the time, it was the most powerful work, essentially, uh, machine they had, was the horse. But actually, with just the, that bridle and the bit in its mouth, you could control how it moved, what it did. And it controls the internal forces of the being. And that's, uh, for us, that could be our own thoughts. When anger is rising in us, the deceit of our own words. What is it that's in us? Can we control that? And the second one is the rudder. And that's actually, he talks about the winds that blow the ship. Those ships in those days with, with their sails was the largest vehicle they had. It was critical to their whole way of life. And he's talking about how uh, the rudder can control that ship from external forces. So for us, that could be the culture around us. The words that we hear. I've, been, I've commented recently 
that I've been in several work meetings recently where people will use the F word. I work in kind of professional services. I guess 20, 30, 40 years ago, everybody thought on the construction site and in, you know, mechanics in the garage might use uh, kind of choice language, but it's now creeping into the boardroom and the meeting rooms in office, offices. It's everywhere. Recently, Tanya and I started watching a series on um, Apple TV Plus uh, called Shrinking. It's not kind of uh, some sort of X-rated TV show. It's just a middle-of-the-road sitcom. And we actually stopped watching it because in one episode, 30 minutes long, there were 30 different episodes where the F word was used. Just all the time, in ev nearly every sentence. And Tanya is much more acutely sensitive to this than me, and maybe that says something about me, but it also because I've been in environments, in sports teams and everything, where some of that language is just commonplace, I don't necessarily hear it, hear it the same way. Maybe it doesn't have the same impact. Maybe it should do. But for her, she's like, I don't want to watch this. I don't need this going into my mind. Maybe it's the ubiquitousness of blaspheming now. OMG is just used everywhere. Do we use that? Should we use that? Or maybe in the pressure of situations that comes to us externally, how do we control the words that we use? When it mentioned a rudder, um, probably going back quite a long time ago, maybe nearly 30 years ago, uh, I was on holiday with my family in the Norfolk Broads and we hired a narrow boat for the day to um, have a nice day trip kind of sailing around uh, the, the canals and the broads there. And it was an interesting experience for a family who had never really done that before in trying to control the boat. And we had no storms about. We had idyllic weather, just like this week. Less windy, in fact, than, than this week. But when you're then trying to control a boat, you realise how only very minor changes on the, the tiller that controls the rudder make very big changes to where the boat is going. And there was one point when we were going to stop for lunch, so we wanted to come into kind of shore, and there was some sort of pontoon where you could then moor your boat so that you could um, stop and have a picnic or whatever it was that you wanted to do. And so my job, my, I think my dad was probably steering and controlling the power and everything, was to kind of jump onto land, and then someone would throw me a rope and I would tie it up. So I did that. To which point they just sailed off massively across the other side and then they were thinking, well, how do we get back? I thought maybe I was just there for the rest of my life. Because we certainly, no one in our family had mastery over the rudder. And you realise that without that, it was gonna, the boat could go anywhere. It was hard to control. And that's just a perfect example. of If, if you're then going to be able to control your tongue in the face of storms, let alone in benign conditions how much mastery you need over that. So do you have mastery over your tongue? Can you control your tongue when internal pressures are rising? Or do you mimic the speech of those around you in different places? Are you consistent? We don't go around here on a Sunday morning swearing at each other, I'm pleased to say. But are you able to say that, how you are at home, church and workplace? Is your language consistent? Is the type of words you speak over people consistent? Are you able to speak blessing over bad drivers? So James has made clear the power of our words. They control our whole being. Then he talks about the impact of our words, and particularly their power to do great harm. He likens it to a fire in verses 5 and 6. We probably all know that phrase, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words shall never harm me. A bigger load of rubbish has never been uttered in all of time. That's just not true, is it? In fact, it's entirely the reverse, because there's also a phrase about the pen is mightier than the sword. The words that we speak over others, the words that are spoken over us, can make a huge difference. Slander, libel, defamation, the way social media works, the harsh words that are said on the playground or in the workplace, and now they can be on WhatsApp or some other means. 
the words that we speak over ourselves, which may be heavily influenced by what others have spoken over us in the past. And in the heat of the moment, or unintentionally, our words can do great harm. And once they've left our mouths or left our um, phone as we send that tweet or that post or that WhatsApp into a group, we can no longer control what happens. That might just be the spark that sets a raging wildfire. 20 years ago, maybe it just would go around a small community, although that still could do huge damage. Now it can go around the world in no time. I'm sure you're familiar with various examples of things that have just taken, gone out of control. Maybe a video is shared or words are shared on Twitter. A spark that becomes a wildfire, even in just the last couple of weeks. If we think about the riots in Ely, now I'm not getting into the whys and wherefores of any of the situations I want to talk about, but it was rumour about were the police chasing those boys. The police then said the word was, we were following them and we're waiting the investigation. I'm sure there's right and wrong on both sides in that moment, but it led to rumours and then that kind of took hold and then we ended up with riots and now we've had 20 people arrested. The power and the impact of words is really important. In my work, um, no one really understands what we do, but some of what I do means we are writing reports that we, um, for relating to the kind of the planning system and it's a legal environment. And I've been on the stand being cross-examined by a barrister on, about the report that I've written. And I might, we are therefore very, very careful about the words that we choose to use. Because if you use a word with a slightly different meaning, that can get twisted. It doesn't matter what you thought you meant, what was in your head when you wrote it, or even what you still think you meant now. That will be twisted by a barrister for their ends if they can do it. So we have to be really, really careful about the words that we use about the meanings, about the definitions of what they are, because what we might think we're saying might not be what the other person think is hearing that we're saying. So we had that, this week, we've seen the Philip Schofield incident. And again, I'm not getting into the whys and wherefores, but just look at the power of the words of everybody on social media, what they're saying about him. And then we've had kind of comparisons to, uh, to the Caroline uh, Flack situation, and yes, there might be differences in the context and the situation, but we've just had this Twitter storm where someone cannot see any point to their life continuing because of the words that people are saying. And everybody is not really thinking there's a person at the end of this. Raging wildfires because of the words that people have spoken. And we're in this age where people's mental health is so damaged, so much of which is fueled by the words that are spoken over them, the words that are spoken to them, the things that they're picking up, the words spoken on social media. And whilst we know that words can be used for good, and we see that in the Bible, James doesn't even bother with that here. He's talking about the harm that they can do. If we are on our own, our words will cause problems. In verse 6, he says, It, the tongue, corrupts the whole person, sets the whole course of his life on fire, and it is itself set on fire by hell. So he's talked about the power of words. He's talked about the impact of words. Then he goes on to say, The tongue is untamable. Great. Shall we just pack up and go home? Having been told we need to tame the tongue, we need to be able to do all this, and otherwise our religion is deceitful, he now says we can't. We can control all sorts of animals, but we can't control the tongue. Not by human power, anyway. He goes on to describe some of those ways. Inconsistency. We've been here this morning praising God, singing Yahweh, Yahweh. And then in the week, do we then go and criticise someone who is made in God's image? And he says that pollution prevails. He talks about if you had, if you can imagine a tap, maybe with like a hot and a cold feed and it's they've got a mixer on it. 
and one is pure water and one is salty water, and then you just turn the tap on and it's mixed, you would never ever know that there was pure water involved. Because the uh, pollution will always overwhelm and contaminate what is pure. The person drinking the water has no idea, only knows about the contaminated water. What might that say about our witness? And then he talks about the indication of the source. We return to that whole issue about what is on the inside. Is it fresh water or salt water? What is the fruit that we bear? And the fruit speaks of the plant. James explains quite clearly that the plant can only bear a particular type of fruit for which it has been created. Grapes come from a vine. Olives come from an olive tree. A fig comes from a fig tree. It can be no other way. Bitter words come from a bitter heart. Critical words from a critical heart. Unloving speech from a heart where the love of Jesus is a stranger, maybe. It reveals what is going on in the heart, our words. In Luke 6 and in Matthew 12, we get the sort of similar quote, for the mouth speaks of what the heart is full of, or out of the overflow of the heart, our mouth speaks. The words that come out of us are a a reflection or just the fruit of what is going on inside us. So what is the remedy? James is not suggesting we just give up and say whatever. He's not suggesting that we're not watchful either. But he's pointing to a much bigger solution in the same way as he pointed to a much bigger problem. If we go back to chapter 1 and verses 26 and 27, we don't want to be that person that considers themselves religious or is saying they're religious But we want to be those that are marked by true religion, that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless. And for that, we're not looking at what we can control in our human strength. We're looking for the transformation that comes from the change on the inside. Rather than a tongue set on fire by hell, we want a tongue set on fire by the Holy Spirit, a tongue set on fire by Jesus. And it's about the source We need the source that is within us to be pure water. And out of that, our words will follow. We've got a perfect example that can be our source. If we go to Genesis 1 and we look at Father God, he speaks life into being. If we look in John 7, we look at Jesus, it says, No man ever spoke like this man. And then we look in Acts at the first Pentecost when the Holy Spirit fell and new speech was given to those human tongues and they spoke again like no one had ever heard. And all the disarray that was created at the Tower of Babel was brought back into unity and everybody heard in their own language. So Father, Son and Holy Spirit, we can see perfect speech. So what can we do? We can ask for God's help for a fresh filling of the spirit, a fresh softening of our heart, that our tongue would be marked by the Holy Spirit, not by the fire of hell. We need to guard our heart because that is the wellspring. We learn speech by being spoken to. When we're a baby, we, it's the, the more that babies are spoken to, the faster they learn to develop speech. We know that actually um, children that are spoken to in multiple languages have far more advanced kind of language systems because of it. And they learn by hearing and being spoken to. So we need to make sure that we are filling ourselves and hearing the words that God speaks over us. That we are filling our heart with the word of God. So that is the speech that we learn and that is the speech that then comes back out of us. That is what is overflowing. We need to focus on speaking in love and that whole 1 Corinthians 13 that you will have heard about without love, we're just a clanging gong. And yes, we need to practice self-control because that is a fruit of the Spirit and we want to be getting better at this. This passage actually finishes pretty abruptly. 
but the next few sections go on to deal with how we don't get polluted, how we live a holy life. And I think that unpacks more about how we will then be able to master the tongue as well. That's really about how do we guard our heart. So um, hopefully, whoever it is that's speaking over the next few weeks will unpack that. And that will aid you further in how you do this. So to conclude, our words are powerful. They're more powerful than we think. They are the master switch. They control all of our being, all of our deeds, all of the way we think, all of the way we act. And they can have huge impact, an impact that we cannot fully control because we are not always the hearer. James has told us that actually in our own strength, our tongue is untamable. We're going to struggle to keep our words perfectly in check through self-control, but there is a remedy and it's all about the source, the source inside of us. So what do we do today? Well, for today, remember, there is always grace. There is always forgiveness. If you know that you haven't been in control of your tongue in the past, if you're sat there thinking, I haven't got control of this thing, I have done damage to others, then there's going to be space as we come to communion for confession and repentance. God is a God of second chances, and that is what uh, communion is about, remembering the cross and what Jesus did for us. We also need to remember that through Jesus there is a new creation inside of us, and there is a hope for the future. We're in the kind of now and the not yet, and I'm not going to unpack all of that, but we're not living a perfect life. We're going to make mistakes So don't beat yourselves up about that. But if you want to grow in control of your tongue, there's going to be an opportunity to ask for that heart change, to ask for new encounter with the Holy Spirit, that what flows out of us will be the overflow of what is going on in the inside. Fill your heart with God's word. Do you want to be like those people who are able to speak life, and hope despite trial and challenge. That comes from a commitment to letting our hearts be changed by God, by letting God speak into our lives through trial, through difficulty, through all the circumstances we go through. That we would mature. It's a life's work to be sanctified and to get this sorted. And finally, have you been hurt or damaged by words? Words from others? Do you struggle to believe the words that God speaks over you? In Hebrews chapter 12, it talks about how Jesus' blood speaks a better word. There is restoration. There is something better. So if that's you today, and you're still hurt from words that have been spoken over you in the past, then don't leave without getting prayer. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the words that you speak over us, that we have an example of a God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit that speak perfectly, that give us an example of speaking life and blessing and hope, but also a Holy Spirit that can dwell within us to enable us to speak those same words. We need to recognise the power that our words have, the impact that our words have, but also that we can't just control that in our own strength, but we need you. So this morning, Holy Spirit, we want you to meet with each one of us. Would our tongues be set on fire by you this morning, not by the power of hell? Would our tongues be used by you as we go out of this building this week to speak blessing and life and hope? And over weeks and months and years, 
would we continue to fill our hearts with the words that you speak? That out of that overflow of what is in us, we would speak blessing. We would speak love. We would speak encouragement. We would speak kindness. We would speak hope. We would speak joy. And as we come to communion this morning, would you help us to receive forgiveness, but also to give forgiveness where we have been damaged by others' words? And would we recognise the words that you speak over us? That the blood that we that was shed, that we celebrate in this meal, speaks a better word. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.